conservation of mass is that in a non-nuclear reaction, so nuclear reactions would be another layer of the chemistry onion that we're not going to get to, so ignore those. In a non-nuclear reaction, mass is neither created nor destroyed. That means that the mass that you start with has to be the same mass that you end with. And so interpretation for us as far as chemical reactions is that the mass of the reactants must equal the mass of the products. The number of atoms of each element on the reactant side must equal the number of atoms of each element on the product side. And number three, so number of molecules, oop, let's go with green, 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 number of molecules Um, concentrations moles which is something we're going to talk about very shortly uh, all three of these things can change from reactants turning into products And uh, let me show you our example chemical reaction. So it's going to be example. It's the same one we just talked a little bit about before. Two H2O molecules goes to two hydrogen molecules plus one O2. And I'm not going to write the one, it's implied. So this is our example chemical reaction. And what we can show is that there are two H2O molecules. Each H2O molecule has two hydrogens, so we have four H's, and we have two oxygens on the reactant side. Then there's the reaction arrow, and then on the other side, there's four H's right here, and Two O's, so four is two times the two, and there's one times two here, and this is the product side. So that really deals with number two, and we're gonna talk about balancing chemical reactions uh, in not this lecture outline, but coming up. Now you can see that the number of molecules, we have two molecules on the reactant side and we have one, two, three on the product side. Those are different, those can change. Concentrations, well, we haven't really talked about that. Moles, I haven't talked too much about that. Those can change as well. Now, on the next page, I have a picture of this chemical reaction and I wanna show a video of it. So let's pull that up. In that small plastic container are two metal push pins, and they're inserted a distance that's between the positive and negative lead of the 9 volt battery. So you just insert them in there and make sure that they're that distance apart, and that should be fine. In the container is going to be some water that has baking soda mixed into it. The baking soda in the water allows electricity to flow between the two metal tips of the push pins. And so now you set them on the leads and the electricity can flow between the two push pins now. And so electricity is flowing through the water. And so that's enough energy to break apart the water, make it undergo a chemical reaction so that the H2O gets broken apart into H2 and O2. It's gonna be hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. and both gases are going to flow up through the test tubes, and one of the gases is going to be in one test tube, and the other one's going to be in the other one. How do you know which one's which? Well, if you take a look at the amount of gas in each test tube, there's going to be twice as much hydrogen gas as oxygen gas. So you can see in the right test tube, you have twice as much hydrogen gas as oxygen gas. This is how it... All right. Just like in the demonstration there, the video, you've got twice as much hydrogen 
has the oxygen. And uh, so let's just make that note. So if we come back to this chemical reaction, we're making twice as much hydrogen as oxygen, two times as much. That's what the two means. So twice as much hydrogen. And that's going to be reflected in the fact that there's twice as much gas here. Twice as much hydrogen gas as O2 gas. And so that's our first little demonstration of how when you do a reaction, those coefficients matter. Okay. All right. So now let's also cover temperature in this. So temperature, there are going to be three main temperature scales. There's Celsius and Kelvin and Fahrenheit. And uh, Celsius is, well, let's look. We've got pictures of them here. Celsius right here has zero degrees as the temperature at which water freezes and 100 degrees as the temperature at which water boils. So Celsius is based, the zero and 100 degrees, based on water freezing and boiling. Based on water freezing and boiling. At least that's how it came up with its numbers of zero and 100. Um, let's skip down to Fahrenheit here for a minute. So Fahrenheit has 32 because it's zero was the coldest temperature that Fahrenheit could make in the lab. And so zero degrees Fahrenheit is the coldest temp And I'm going to use coldest T using ice, salt, and water. That's what he used. Ice, salt, and water. And so the fact that the coldest temperature is below freezing is how you make ice cream using a salt water uh, and ice concoction, if you've ever seen or done that. If you haven't, I encourage you to Google it. Here, 100 degrees Fahrenheit was body temperature. And we now consider that 98.6. He was a little off, but still pretty good. Um, and, uh, but <coughs> Fahrenheit is mostly only used in the United States, so we are not too concerned with that. Um, and it's not used in scientific measurements at all. Now, Kelvin, you can see that 100 Kelvins is also 100 Celsius degrees. So Kelvin and Celsius degrees, or Kelvin and Celsius, let's say this. Kelvin, one Kelvin equals one degree Celsius. The degrees are the same size. Size. I shouldn't say degrees because Kelvin has no degree symbol. And so please just write Kelvin and not Kelvin degrees. I've made that mistake myself, so don't worry too much about it. And then, but you can see that absolute zero down here. We mentioned that before. So zero Kelvin is absolute zero. It is the coldest temperature you can make. That is the coldest temperature possible. In fact, we can't make it. It is a limit. Absolute zero, all motion stops. No kinetic energy at zero Kelvin. No capital KE, kinetic energy, at zero Kelvin. Oftentimes it looks like OK, so sometimes I like to write out the Kelvin part. You don't have to. So those are our three temperature scales. We will have to convert back and forth. So uh, let me give you the conversions. Um, 
And I'm trying to see if these conversions are on your conversion equation sheet. There's the one for degree Fahrenheit equals 1.8 degrees Celsius. plus 32, so that's multiplied there. And the one I don't see is one that you will have to memorize, but you will use it so much. So Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273.15. Um, and again, so this is given, and this is a memorize. And as much as possible, I try and block off or square off and then write things that you have to memorize for your exams. Now, um, we're going to do two of these problems. This third one's going to be a companion problem, so you don't have to do it. You can, and I will post the answers. Convert minus 25 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. So let's see. So Kelvin equals minus 25 plus 273. plus 273.15. I will tell you for this course, the 0.15 never makes a significant difference for us. You can see that the sig figs here uh, will just be to the ones place. There are no decimal places in this number anyway. So this is going to be, let me get out my calculator to make sure. So 25 minus plus 273.15, I get 248 and to the fewest number of decimal places, I get 248 Kelvin and three sig figs for lecture and exams and homeworks are always fine. Now, I will need my calculator for this one. 68 degrees Fahrenheit, so uh, we keep our heat at 65 in the winter time, so this is a little warmer um, than that. So let's see, so I'm gonna put in 68 degrees Fahrenheit equals 1.8, and instead of degrees Celsius, I'm just gonna call it X plus 32. To solve this, I'm going to subtract 32 from both sides. 68 minus 32, I get 36 equals 1.8x, and then divide both sides by 1.8, and I get 36 divided by 1.8 equals 20. So 20 degrees Celsius, which is considered a little colder than room temperature, is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I'll let you convert 77 degrees Fahrenheit into Celsius yourself, should you choose.